Hey, sports fans, it's Larry Eater, Run Blog. Run, this is our program, Socialing the Distance. And our guest today is Tom Jordan, the meet director of the Prefontaine Classic. Tom, hello. How are you doing? Doing very well. Thanks, Larry. Now, you're in Eugene, correct? That is the, correct. Yeah. The track capital of Lane County is Mr. Dunaway. <laughs> totally. You know, and I didn't know that whole Lane County thing until <laughs> Dunaway just looks at me one day and goes, yeah. Not the track capital of the world, track capital of Lane County. And I just laughed. And so I, I, I knew you would appreciate that too. Yeah. Um, when did you start as the meet director at, at Pre? Was it the renovation meet? Were, did, were you the uh, meet director at the renovation? Or? No, it was, um, oh gosh, several years after that. It was 1984. Okay. And uh, the previous meet director, Pat Holleran, who's a runner of Note, Note yeah. Band, he had been the meet director for three or four years, I believe. And uh, uh, he got a full-time job. <laughs> and wow. the thing about putting on a track meet like the Prefontaine is it's not a full-time job, but it's not a part-time job either. Yeah, so you yeah. can't really do both. And uh, so, uh, you know, the uh, Oregon Track Club, which started the Prefontaine Classic, asked me if I would uh, be the meet director. And I remember saying, I, I'd worked at Track and Field News and I've been to hundreds of meets, obviously. And I, I remember saying, well, I've never put on a track meet. That doesn't, didn't mean I didn't want to, mm -hmm. because like a lot of track fans, I was bored stiff at most track meets. Yeah. And I thought, boy, I'd love to have the opportunity to put on a track meet that I'd like to see. Mm -hmm. And that's what started our um, five minutes between track events format. Sometimes we don't quite hit that. Maybe it's six or seven minutes, but particularly since TV hates it because yeah. they don't have time for the commercials. Mm -hmm. But um, I loved it, and the fans love it. And oh, yeah. so many people say, you know, I, I'm not really a track fan, but I never miss the Prefontaine Classic because it is exciting from the start to finish. First time I went to the meet was in maybe 1989, 1989, 1990. I've missed two years since then. Um, the crowd is so into it every year. And I do love the clockwork. It just goes and goes and goes. And the one that always blows my mind is now you have two miles. You have the Bowerman mile, you have the international mile. And for a few minutes, you know, everybody's going, ooh, about a 352, and then boom, you guys kind of, you, you put it into over overdrive. What is your favorite event to kind of orchestrate at the pre-classic? Ooh, favorite event, I, probably the women's 1500. Okay, okay. Because over the years, there have been some exceptional performers. Mm -hmm. And you put together a field and... You can have absolute um, mastery of, of the event out on the track, and you can have um, agony of defeat out on the track. Yes, yes. And so, you know, you look through the years and you see some of these great races, and the Women's 1500 has more than its share. Oh, I agree. I also have to tell you, men's pole vault, it's where I met Mondo Duplantis and got to watch him with his dad. I remember his dad competing and uh, then, you know, uh, uh, watched him with his family and watched him with Kendricks and Renault. Um, men's shot put always totally blows my mind. You get just crazy shot put crowds, you know, and teams. And, and it's interesting to watch people who are middle distance fans get into the field events too. I think you guys really – have done a great job with that. Um, did you know Steve Prefontaine? I did. Um, okay. He probably couldn't tell you my name. Okay. I was working for Track and Field News, and so sure. several times I, uh, I won't say interviewed him because uh, typically there were a lot of other journalists around. But the one time that I really sort of had a one-on-one -on -one with him was at the. Uh, LA Times indoor meet, I think in 1974. And okay. uh, he was, uh, I was sitting in the bar 
uh, I didn't drink a lot then, but I probably was having a drink. And he came in and slid into the stool next to me and just started chatting. And wow. he had that ability to make you feel that you were the only person in the room. And so here was this guy who was at the time the most popular track and field athlete in the United States. Mm -hmm. He's sitting there chatting me up. And so uh, that was sort of a, uh, I won't go so far as to say bonding, but it certainly would made an impression on me to the point where I was a pre-fan from then on. You wrote the book pre. What is, if you were talking to a group of high school kids and they kind of know who pre is, Steve Prefontaine is, what do you think they need to know? What, what is the... <laughs> What is the legacy of Steve Prefontaine? Uh, I think it's the way he articulated some of the um, the truisms that we who were middle and long distance runners feel about the sport. Uh, you know, to give anything less than your best is to sacrifice the gift. I mean, that's poetic. That's yeah, poetic. yeah. And, and yet it captures what it is for those athletes who go out and give their best and do their best. And, you know, sometimes they come up short, pre did in the uh, 72 Olympic games, but sometimes they are successful as well. And if nothing else, they learn a lot about life from those lessons. In a Kenny Moore piece, he had asked Frank Shorter how to describe Steve Prefontaine. And I think the quote was, imagine a satyr. So was Steve Prefontaine a bit of the life of the party at uh, his in in his era? I don't know. I wasn't at those parties, but mm-hmm. I, I certainly <laughs> I certainly have great uh, memories. Um, I remember sitting in the lobby of a hotel in L.A. and uh, Pre was on the couch, uh, one over, and a, a, an athlete who shall remain nameless came in and was obviously altered. And um, I remember pre yelling out across the lobby, hey, great quays, huh? Great quays. And for those youngsters who don't understand, he was referring to quaaludes, which uh, were very often taken as downers. Yes. After to offset the uppers that some of the, uh, you know, back in the 70s. Oh, sure. Not a whole lot of drug testing back then. No, there, there was not. Um, was it tough for you? You orchestrate this meet, and it's like, I call it three hours of Zen track, right? Because you just go event, 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 event. And then you started doing the Friday night thing, and I'm kind of like going, okay, Tom's done this three hours of ultimate track. What the hell is he going to do on another night? And you guys did it. I mean, that one year you did the 25K, and then that's where I got, we got to see Mo do his first, you know, first real serious 10K, I believe. And that was a brilliant, I mean, race. There were so many great 10Ks that night. And then you would throw in all kinds of events. Um, what was the inspiration to do a second uh, day or night of track and field? Well, it was mainly that when we joined the, the Diamond League in 2010, Mm-hmm. The format was to be two and a half hours maximum, two hours, 15 minutes. Okay. Which is great. I, that's perfect for, I think, the Saturday show, the main show. Sure. But at the same time, there were all of these athletes and events that we wanted to showcase. And, uh, you know, you talked about Mo in the 10K. We had Galen Rupp set the American record at 10K. Yep. Well, you couldn't do that in the two hour and 15 minute window. Mm-hmm. But you could do it the night before. And, of course, uh, John Capriotti at Nike, whom I've worked with for 25, 26 years, um, he had signed all these fabulous athletes. So, you know, there were times when we're going, we can't get it into the program on Saturday, but they could go on Friday. And we called it distance night uh, for the first couple of years in honor of Jeff Hollister, who was one of the original Nike guys who uh, helped the meet. And, um, you know, for a while, it was mostly middle and long distance. But then we started adding some of the field events in. And 
Uh, you know, one year we had the, the pole vault that Friday night. Mm-hmm. And the decision was made early on, we, we'd make it free. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, there were people who said, look, let's, let's charge a nominal amount, blah, blah, blah. But what they don't understand about events is you've got fixed costs involved when you charge money. Yeah. And so you really have to charge a significant amount to cover those costs. And by going free, I think we generated a, a ton of positive feedback because let's say you're, you're low income and you've got a family and you can't afford the price on Saturday, which yeah. is still low, by the way, but, sure. but you can come on Friday night and get a world-class experience for free. I know the, uh, for me, for about 10 years before I got to go to Europe, I got to see the Prefontaine, and that was my expectation of, wow, this is what a European track meet's like. Um, you've had some incredible sprint races and some really talented 100-meter runners, but I got to tell you, I love the 200 there. <laughs> it's just a screamer, men and women. Um, do you have a favorite 200 race? Uh that's a very good question because, you know, Michael Johnson ran the 200 at Pre. Yeah. That was, that's probably the most significant one as far as I'm concerned, just because who he was, how good he was. Yeah. Uh, he set the, the me record that, for all I know, it was still, still standing. But um, I think that that was probably the, the top for me on the men's side. Mm-hmm. On the women, Golly, you can't beat Shawnee Miller. She is so yeah. good. Yeah, yeah, And uh, you'll, you'll love this. We're having both the men's and women's 200 on Saturday at the pre-class. Awesome. Two weeks after the Olympic Games. So I- let's let's talk about this lovely schedule this year. And, uh, and I don't want to go back a little bit, too. I wanted to pay a compliment to you about when they were um, – dissecting Hayward Field, and you had to move to that little school down by my father's house at uh, Stanford. I thought you guys did a killer job down there, and my comments were, I called it pre in exile, and I was waiting to get a dirty note from you because I spent the next month putting photos up, and I was waiting for Cap to just to go, Peter, you got to stop. But I just put pre in exile, and I put Stanford and then, you know, whoever's doing the pictures. It was a fantastic meet. It just wasn't Prefontaine Classic, you know. The, there were people who came from Oregon who, you know, came down. They can actually fly and drive and things. And the crowd was great. And I remember um, Paul Mosher telling me, hey, we're putting up like 2,000 more seats in the last week, man. You know, and I'm just going, okay, there should be two Diamond League meets on the West Coast, pre, and then there should be one at Stanford. Yeah. It, I thought you did an amazing job moving the meat, keeping the flavor. But Stanford, as much as I love Stanford, is not the University of Oregon campus. No. How do you comment on that without getting in trouble? <laughs> well, I can start off by saying that um, the uh, track surface there, mm-hmm. that's where I used to run my workouts. Really? Yeah. After I, uh, after I left school, I, I, you know, joined the West Valley Track Club. Sure. It was a dirt track, and wow. uh, we needed wow. to be there and, and run uh, uh, workouts. And uh, I think the times were probably bogus, but uh, <laughs> they were fast. So I yeah, didn't. there you go. And uh, so I have, you know, very fond memories of uh, the place. And I would say that we certainly wanted to have a Prefontaine Classic. Yeah. He couldn't go without having one. And the idea was, okay, we'll take one year off uh, and go, go to a, an appropriate venue. And then, of course, Hayward Field will be finished and blah, blah, blah. Well, obviously, in 2019, it wasn't finished. And yeah. Uh, yeah. 2020, we had COVID. And ended up having to, uh, well, actually, no, 2020, that's this year. Yeah. yeah, we had COVID and 
you know, we, we simply couldn't put on a, any kind of what I consider a Prefontaine classic. So the decision was made to pull the plug. So that's two years not being at Hayward Field. And of course, Hayward Field has completely changed too. So, Did you seriously consider holding the meet in 2020? Were there, oh, oh, no, no there were several different ways of doing yeah, it? Yeah, we looked at it. We looked at moving to October. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, work out with the U of O football schedule, et cetera, et cetera. But of course, I think one of the tipping points was when uh, we realized we'd have to put on the meet with no spectators. All the athletes would have to quarantine for at least 10 days. Yeah. Um, and that the uh, county officials were saying, well, what are you going to do about the people outside Hayward Field who are wanting to catch a glimpse? How are you yeah. going to test them? Yeah, and yeah. They were putting all of that on the event, and there was just no Wow. Yeah. Um, so the 2021 schedule has come out by our dear friends at the Diamond League. Um, what are your deep thoughts? And I know you've just seen it over a short period of time. Uh, any thoughts on the, the schedule? Is it ambitious? Is it too ambitious? Is it trying to deal with the situation that we have? Yeah, I think there are various scenarios, uh, all of which allow us to put on 14 meets. The question mm-hmm. is, will they be Diamond League quality meets? Yeah, yeah. That's one of the main reasons we wanted to get away from our traditional date at the end of May. You know, by the, I don't think by the end of May, um, you know, COVID will be beaten down. Yeah. And certainly uh, it's unlikely that the population as a whole will be vaccinated enough to allow a significant number of spectators. Yeah. But having one almost, having to meet almost three months later, at least gives us a fighting chance to be able to go out and certainly get the athletes coming from Tokyo, coming from Shanghai, uh, hopefully not having to quarantine them for a long period of time. And then maybe, but just maybe, being able to get a significant number of fans in the stands. What is the, um, when, when COVID first reared its charming head in January, uh, February of uh, 2020, um, I was getting ready to head over to the European world, in, you know, indoor circuit, and I shut it down. I talked to a guy from CDC, and he said, hey, uh, <laughs> yeah, you want to spend three months in Hungary? Um, and as much as I would like to, uh, um, I can only have so much goulash and stuff. Um, what were your first thoughts? Did you anticipate early on how challenging this was going to be? Uh, no, not at all. I had come. I was coming from the Ebola um, Zika, H1N1 history going, sure. okay, this is something that may affect, um, a South American country or certainly China where it started, but, um, you know, WHO and the others will get this under control. And yeah, uh, what was it that we had at Ebola? Like eight people got infected or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I can live with eight people out of, you know, 375 million. Yeah. But um, it soon became clear that this was a um, highly contagious virus that people were not taking seriously. Yeah. And so, you know, it was kind of like watching a, a runaway train where you're on the tracks and you see yeah. it come, coming towards you and you're going, you know, I better get off this track. And that's that's what we did basically this year was saving mm-hmm. Can't do it. In a non-pandemic year, what is the biggest challenge for you putting on? Okay, I'm going to break this up into segments because normally I just throw all the shit at you and you go, either would you not do acid before we have these things? Um, so um, what is the biggest challenge is a Diamond League meet director for you doing the Prefontaine Classic? Biggest challenge. Hmm. I have to think about that one because there are certainly numerous challenges, but one of the things that 
I've been very fortunate in having happen is that I've got brought, I have a team that comes in year after year. Yeah. In the meet. And, and some of them have been coming for 15 years, 20 years, 30 years. Wow. You know, Garros, Gary and Jules. Yeah. They, they were doing what they do before I was meet director, and I've been doing it for 36 years. Wow. Um, these are people that are highly experienced. And, uh, I, you know, if you'd asked me uh, 15 years ago, I would have said, well, the logistics of putting on the meet on the day, all the moving parts. Yeah. But now, because we've expanded so much, there are people to handle the venue, people to handle the uh, setup, people, you know, the hotels, et cetera. I, I can, and, you know, I tell this story. Um, back in the day, and this is going to get old for the young people, but uh, this is the day before there was anything like a fax machine or certainly no email or whatever. Uh -huh. When I put out a press release, I would deliver it to the register guard and to the two television stations. There were only two then. Wow. Because otherwise they wouldn't get it. I couldn't put it in the mail. Yeah. So I drop it off and you know, wow. that helped. And then I chatted up the register guard folks. Got sure. to know them for years. But you know, it, now I've got Howie Willman, you know yeah. very well, doing the uh, press releases. And uh, Ross Crampley and his crew send it out to the four corners of the world. Yep, they do a great job. They do a fantastic job. And so I just don't worry about that. I mean, I still yeah. look things over to make sure that my name's spelled right. But Yeah, uh, of course. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I would say, you know, with the incredible support we've gotten from Nike over the years, the, the idea of the funding for the meet. Yeah. It, is not really a big issue for me because when the folks there say, go ahead and do it, I know that we're going to have the money to do it. And then what is the challenge for you with television? Because TV is such a big part of the meat success, you know, um, and you guys do such a great job with it too. Well, I think probably the biggest challenge uh, is the fact that we want to run the meet every five minutes on the track, and they're yeah. saying, can't do that, you know? Can't. Yeah. So, um, you know, generally, we've gotten along very well with television. They understand uh, the, the kinds of things that we're looking at, mm -hmm. and we understand the kinds of things they're looking at. So things have been pretty smooth the last... 10 years. Okay. Okay. Um, so this year, the meet's going to be after the Olympics. What's your deep thoughts about that so far? Well, I'm, I'm kind of excited. You know, uh, as far as I can remember, we've never had a Prefontaine Classic after an Olympics. Yeah, I can't think of one either. In 84, we were two weeks before the Olympics. Mm -hmm. And that was special, too. Yeah. But um, it's like I was uh, saying to Chris Hansen of the Register Guard, you know, years and years and years, we promote the pre-classic is, you know, we have 10 Olympic gold medalists from Rio, but we're promoting it the following year. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Year old. This will be two weeks old. Yeah. So you talk yeah. about the men's and women's 200 meters. Hopefully we'll have the gold medalists in each of those. Yeah. I've watched you travel around the circuit. Uh, we've shared a glass of that red stuff once in a while, mm -hmm. and you are observing meats. Um, I remember talking to Clyde Hart and Jim Bush, and so this is a quick story, but you'll see where I'm going. And I asked Coach Bush, hey, so how did you come up with your 400 workouts? He said, well, I stole this one from Clyde. And then when I talked to Clyde, I said, Coach Hart, how did you put this stuff together for Michael? I said, well, Larry, the truth is I stole Tuesdays from Jim. And so let's just say out of respect, you model things after something you've seen at another meet. What is an innovation or something that you've seen done at another meet that you liked and said, hey, I'm going to see if it would work out at pre. Is there anything that you've seen that you well, really uh, kind of dug? 
I think there are some things that television would love to see. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, the uh, the card on the track with the, the camera. Yeah. Even better, the camera on the inside of the track. Sure. So that you can get that whole uh, final straightaway. At, at historic Hayward Field, that just wasn't possible. Mm -hmm. With the new venue, I'm not sure what is possible, but I'm anticipating that something like that might happen because with the World Championships coming in 2022, you know, the world feed is definitely going to want to have that kind of technology. And uh, I'm intrigued by this pacing light deal. I mean, yeah. those of us of a certain age remember the ITA days. Yeah, you know, I brought that up because none of the young folks at WA got it. And I remember Dunaway telling me the story, right? I'm pulling, because I got some of Jim's notes. I'm going through this stuff and I'm just going, hey, kids, this isn't anything new. 1974, I watched it on TV, you know. Um, do you think it is an athletic aid? I don't understand that one. I mean, I think it enhances the viewing, but why was Yost Hermans having to defend himself and saying, well, this is really aiding the athlete? I don't understand that. I mean, can you okay. offer any? Well, I, I, do I think it's an aid? Yes. Okay. Do I think it's a significant aid? For one thing, the person it may aid the most is the pacer. Yeah. Okay. Okay. These have been legal for forever. Yeah. But you get somebody out there who doesn't know what they're doing mm -hmm. or, you know, gets the adrenaline pumping so fast that they, they uh, go out way too, too quickly. Um, it would certainly be a help for them to look down and see, Hey, I'm right where I'm supposed to be. And so I think it may help the pacer more than the, the athlete behind because it's still, the athlete who's actually contesting the event is still going to have to make the decision, do I go with a pacer or not? And how many races have we seen where the pacer is right on? Yeah. Because, and, he's, and it's been requested of him or her to do a certain pace. Sure. And all the, the pack is 20 meters behind. So, I mean, it's, so it's, nice. it's a waste of time. Let's talk about Pacers for a second. I recall a couple times where um, Cap told me trying to get someone who could go through the 5,000 and 13.5, 13.10 was like insane. There's an art to dealing with Pacers. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how would you explain that to the uninformed? Well, thank you for reminding me about this, Larry, because <laughs> previous question was the biggest challenge as a meet director. Yeah. Was fi is finding pacers. Really? Yes. Not the pacers for like the 800 meters or, but you, t you talk about uh, wanting to find somebody and say a 10,000. Sure. They want a, a 5,000 split of 1308. Yeah. And I'm looking at the list and I'm going, there are seven men last year who ran the 5K faster than 1308. Yeah. And you're wanting me <laughs> and, and some of my, uh, my uh, colleagues at Nike to find somebody who not only can run from the front, uh, sub 1308, but will do it. Because these are people who, are Olympic hopefuls themselves. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, you look at like um, Dababa, her first uh, world record. Her pacer was her sister. Yes, I remember that. Yeah, yeah. Well, okay, blood's thicker than water. So yeah, sis will go out and, and sacrifice herself. Yeah. But most of the, in most cases, that's not possible. And and so yes, definitely, that is the most challenging thing I have to deal with. Okay. Um, the, I've, you've had good long jumps. You've had some pretty amazing triple jumps with Christian Taylor and, and, uh, the whole crew. Um, so the Diamond League pulled some events out of their repertoire over the last couple of years. Um, any deep thoughts on, uh, I appreciate the idea of what they're trying to do is to is to modernize track and field. 
and to put it into a format, like you said, two hours and 15 minutes. But when, when you've got, you, you know, when Nike and Adidas have 90% of the sponsored elite athletes in the world, mm-hmm. and you've got them in virtually every event, and, you know, <laughs> Nike loves to have not only the 100, the 200, the 400, the steeple, blah, blah. They're going to have people in every event. How do you, you have, you've got your Diamond League events. And then how do you make the decisions about the other events? Well, you'll be happy to know that we have added those events back in as Diamond League events. Good. There are, there are 32 events uh, again. Mm-hmm. So each, of, each of those events is a Diamond League event. However, there won't be as many, say, 5,000, 3,000, 5,000 as there would be 100-meter sprints. Okay, sure. Um, there may there won't be as many um, probably triple jumps as okay. there was were in the past because mm-hmm. no model was every event gets the same number of opportunities to compete. Yeah, that's just not working. That's that's in reference to what you were saying. Sure. So, uh, you know, I think the good news is it's back in, and um, I'm I'm very happy with our events. They're not. Uh, confirmed yet so i can't really blab them off here on uh, on the podcast but i think that we've got the uh, the representative events that we want to have and we also have the uh, possibility of having additional events like on friday on friday night so let's say that um someone wanted a, a fast ten thousand meters we could add that and okay. uh, just as we have in the past. So we've got some flexibility and, uh, you know, the limiting factor is money. Yeah. Uh, you know, every, every event costs a small fortune. Every event at the meet now costs more than the entire Prefontaine Classic budget for the first 20 years I did the meet. Wow. All right. So here's a question. I, I'm going to try to do this statesmanlike, which I know is really a big thing to ask for me. What, the way I understand it is that in the Nike contracts, there's a certain number of years that athletes have to come to the Prefontaine. Mm-hmm. And I love it. I think it's like this, uh, I think I told Mark Parker one time, it's like this public affirmation that you guys are a track, uh, you're, you're a track and field company. And he liked that. He thought that was kind of cool. All right. So give me that. And I'm looking at the value of what you guys put together on a meet. And I was talking to a guy at the Financial Times, and they said, you know, the average European meet's got a value of, like, 3 million U.S. And I look at it, and I kind of go, Prefontaine's got to be in the 6 to 7 million range. When you think about if you put together what you would on the market would have to do to get these athletes, am I in the ballpark? Yeah, I, I haven't I haven't penciled that out because yeah. as you say, uh, the Nike athletes come as part of their contract, and so that doesn't enter into the meat budget. There's not we're not paying an appearance fee on top. Sure. Of it. Yeah. But um, just to back up for just a second, uh, Rudy Chapa, whom you know, yes. uh, spoke at the Oregon Track Club annual meeting in 2001, and this is after yeah. he. Did transitioned out of Nike. Sure. um, He said that one of the things he was most proud of during his time as Nike was to insert that clause into the contract for athletes. Wow. Which, you know, no one realized it at the time, including me, but that guaranteed we would have great fields each and every year. As long as Nike signs those athletes, yeah, and we have their events, they're going to be here. And so that's that's such a, you know, we put out our first press release in a typical year at our annual meeting in February, and it's usually a, a field event like the sure. Cold Ball, yep. Shot Put, etc. Well, usually we can get all top eight athletes from the year before because seven of them are Nike. And yep. we know they're going to be there. And then the one that isn't, you know, we, we uh, make sure we get a deal with. So um, just as an example, you know, 
you got Ryan Krauser, you yep. got Tom, Tom Walsh, and you got Joe Kovacs. And Joe is not Nike, so we work out a deal with his his representation, and we've got the top three in the world right there. Oh yeah, no, it, it's yeah. totally awesome. Yeah. So I'm going to give you now. I warned you about this. Okay. Five athletes' names. Yeah. All right. At our advanced age, we're going to go three to five words. Okay. Okay. Hikam El Garouche. Classy. Smooth. And I would say um, one of a kind. Allison Felix. <laughs> You're picking all the classy ones. Uh, yeah, well, I'm going to throw some weird, a couple, a couple uh, interesting ones at you. No, I mean Allison, um, uh, iconic, um, determined. And talented. Richie Boulet. Richie Boulet. 1990, was it? Uh, three? Mom? Well, you know, you're gonna you're gonna really put me on the spot here because it's like when Mondo first came to Pre. Yeah. I, I was talking with Greg, his dad, who had been in the Pre Classic. Yep. Yeah. And I said something like, yeah, didn't you get fourth in like the, uh, the 1980 blah, 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 Prefontaine? He goes, Tom, I won that. Ah, yes, yes, yes. Richie Boulay. Now, isn't Richie a Cal guy? Yes, he is. Okay, so he's a uh, Oski Bites. Um, he's... Um, Lean. Okay, very good. Yeah, and uh, free spirit. Okay. Ryan Krauser. Oh, man. Um, bloodlines. The best ever. I know that's not one word, but no, I, I just interviewed him. I, you know, I thought Sam Kendricks was the next coming, and I look at both of those, and I just go, "Gosh, we're so lucky to have people like that in the sport." Um, okay, so here's my final one for you, and I'm just trying to think about someone who really kind of put it. Okay. Not Matthew Centrowitz. We know Matthew, but how about Matt Centrowitz, the dad? How would you, what kind of words could you use that are clean to uh, describe that colorful human being? Curmudgeon. Okay, like that. Brutal competitor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and a coach. Yeah. I had a few minutes with Matthew. It's got to be in 2014. And I said, yeah, I said, I've known your dad for a long time. And he looked at me and he goes, uh, you think I'm like him? And I said, oh, dear God, it scares the hell out of me. You know, <laughs> it's just it's fun just to watch it. You know, and it's just and that was so much fun in Rio just to watch wow. that young man put his stuff together. Um, the. You've got a room. When we're down to the last couple minutes, so I want, want you to think about this one. You've got a room with 100 kids from Eugene, one of the Eugene high schools, mm -hmm. and they've never been to the Prefontaine. What are you going to tell them about why they should come to the Prefontaine meet? They're going to see the best athletes in the world. You're going to see what a very few people can achieve but a great many people try to achieve. And if you come to the Prefontaine Classic, don't expect every meet to be as good. That's, that's true. Thank you, Tom. Um, I, 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 do, I, get, I get this a lot is, uh, 
you know, I brought my sister, sister-in-law, blah, 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 to the pre. She'd never been to a track meet. She loved it. And I said, never let her go to another one that's not the Prefontaine Classic. It's true. Tom Jordan, thank you so much for this afternoon. Uh, you survived 39 minutes with me, which is, you know, we've talked more than that. But, you know, and you've always been very thoughtful and dealt with my stuff over the years. So I do appreciate that. And you allow me to put some questions together for you. That's, you know, my favorite thing to do is to put the questions together. It is like, I drive everybody crazy. I get really excited about it. So thank you for allowing me to do that in the past years. This is Larry Eater with Run Blog Run, who's our program, Socialing the Distance. And we've been uh, chatting with uh, Prefontaine Meet Director Tom Jordan, one of my favorite human beings, and a person that soon, as this stuff gets under a bit of control, we're going to share a nice red wine somewhere. Absolutely. Tom, thank you. Have a great Thanksgiving. Same to you, Larry. All right, thank you. Hey, sports fans, Larry Eater. It's the program, your favorite program, Socialing the Distance. We just interviewed Tom Jordan, the meat director of the Prefontaine Classic, former, um, I think he was managing editor at Track and Field News, the Bible of the Sport. Um, and this is the Larry monologue, as you know. But I'm going to tell you some things about Tom that you don't know. He's a pretty exceptional person. He's one of the, my favorite human beings. He has got a wicked sense of humor. And he's developed a legacy for Steve Prefontaine. Um, I was a senior in high school when uh, Steve Prefontaine died. In May of 1975, and I remember my stomach just uh, falling apart. Um, and I, I just couldn't believe it. But Pre was a rock star. Uh, you got to think of, uh, oh my gosh, uh, at the time, he had the braggadocio of a Joe Namath. He had the charisma of a Rod Stewart. And uh, he had a great sense of humor. Did he have an ego? Oh, dear God, yes. And that was one of the things we love. He had every American record from 2,000 meters to the 10. Uh, hell, I only learned about the 2,000 because of him and the 10 because of him. And when he had his pre-Montreal shoes, I went out and bought them that year, ran my first 10,000 in them, my first hour run championship. Uh, they were fantastic shoes. Uh, Pre was one of the first uh, athletes to – Wear Nike stuff. I mean, I have pictures of him in Adidas, which he ran 72 Olympics and, and stuff after that. But he he and Jeff Hollister were the two guys who did uh, sports marketing for Nike when it was a, a very, very young company. And they were giving the uh, running shoes out and embalming fluid boxes. Uh, the name came from uh, Jeff Johnson, a uh, good friend of uh, Prefontaine's and Jeff Hollister's. He, I think he got it in a dream. And again, and the embalming uh, fluid boxes is true uh, because I think Jeff lived above a, um, uh, a mausoleum or a, a, a funeral home. Uh, and there was a lot of boxes from embalming fluid. I worked, I was a grave digger for a while, so I know some of that stuff. Um, Tom Jordan, what makes Tom Jordan incredible, though, is that he's been able to take his passion for the sport. And he wrote the seminal book on Steve Prefontaine pre uh, you should read it. I've read it about 15 times. It was one of those books with Once a Runner and Ron Dawes' Self-Made Olympian that I would read each summer to get me pumped up to to train where, where I needed to train. It just got us to that place. Um, but since 1985, Tom Jordan's been doing this meet, and it is a celebration of all things Nike. Um, and, and Nike support for it early on was, you know, they – how do they support meets? It was not like they should, they do now. Um, and I think I've been to every meet but two since ni maybe 1990. Uh, I, I, I didn't get to go to Europe until 1995. So for my first few years, that was the meet to see. Prefontaine was where I got to see a lot of the stars from all over the world. It's pretty cool. It was pretty exciting. And uh, it's always lived up to it. And I love the almost breathless uh, um, series and most breathless timing of the meet about five minutes apart. It's got to infuriate the folks at NBC because, you know, they would like to have a few more minutes so they can do the stories in depth. But Tom wants to put a meet on that the fans go, oh, my gosh. You know, the great uh, meet impresario Ian Stewart uh, over in uh, 
the UK, who I used to spend some time with and have missed seeing that charming man for the last couple of years, talked about the orchestration of a meet. And that's what Tom does. And I asked one of um, Tom Jordan's good friends, uh, John Capriotti, who up until recently was the global sports marketing director for athletics at Nike and is a consultant for Nike. This is what John wrote for me. It has been great working with Tom Jordan hand in hand. Love his passion for the man, the man, Steve Prefontaine. Love his passion for the meat. We both share the same vision of making it the best athletics meeting in the world. Love his passion for the pre-meet. To make the Prefontaine meet the best athletics meeting in the world is our North Star star in terms of our vision. That's really cool. What I've said for years was that what Nike does with the Prefontaine meet is tell its employees, this is why we do it all. And that's why the meet's so important. And I've seen some tremendous races over the years. Watching Mo Farah run his first 10,000, watching Galen Rupps at the American record, uh, watching some amazing 1,500 miles, watching Renola Villanay and Sam Kendricks and Mo Dupont, uh, Mondo DePontis in the pole vault, watching Ryan Krauser, Joe Kovacs, um, and all the other crazies. Remember Christian Cantwell in the shot put, um, watching Allison Felix and Shawnee Miller Weibo in the 200 and the 400. Um, it, it's been, I remember Ma uh, Maurice Green running the 100 there. It's just incredible. But think about that. Putting together a track meet is an art, not a science. And Tom Jordan's been doing this job for 36 years. A couple of questions I forgot to ask him. I think he wants to do it for a couple more years, but we'll, we'll ask him. He, uh, Tom is a pretty charming guy. He's a lot of fun. He's got a good sense of humor. He's a key observer of the sport, and he wants to make this meet the best in the world, as John Capriotti said. There's also a, a quote that um, Tom brought up about our a dear friend, Rudy Chapa, who was a sports marketing global director before John Capriotti, I believe, um, and uh, in, in 2000, 2001, Rudy was quoted as, at a gathering of the Oregon Track Club as saying one of his proudest moments was inserting a clause in all the athletes for Nike's contracts that they had to compete at the pre a certain number of years. If I sat down and went dollar for dollar about how much each one of these athletes is valued at, you got to think that the, the pre-classic has about six to seven million in terms of star value, which is pretty impressive for two and a half hours on a Saturday and a couple hours on a Friday night. Um, but this is what that meat does. Um, that meat celebrates all that's great in our sport. It celebrates the importance of running, jumping, and throwing in the mad world we live in. The new Hayward Field, which I'm looking forward to see, will be a sanctuary to our sport. And it's really appropriate that the Prefontaine Classic this year, held two weeks after the Olympics, will take place there. I love the Pre at uh, Stanford. I actually think Stanford should have a Diamond League meet uh, down there too, but it's not the Prefontaine. Uh, there's something about Hayward Field. There's something about Eugene, Oregon. There's something about watching the crowd, uh, watching the people who have been coming there since Steve Prefontaine ran around the track. And I still think the ghost of Steve Prefontaine is sitting up in the uh, uh, the grandstands, and he's got his U of O uh, hoodie on and his um, old uh, straight leg jeans, and he's got a uh, veggie burrito and a uh, a domestic or imported beer of his choice in a paper bag, watching the meet, enjoying the javelin, enjoying the the shot put, enjoying the miles, enjoying everything. And uh, with that, this is Larry Eater with Run Blog Run, thanking you for enjoying socialing the distance. This is the epilogue where we celebrated Tom Jordan, uh, the meet director at the Nike Prefontaine Classic 
and one of my favorite human beings. Uh, if you like Run Blog Run, um, like us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. If you love us, um, uh, sign up for YouTube and uh, enjoy our YouTube channel. Larry Eater, wishing you everybody a happy holiday season, and we'll talk with you soon.